Are you wanting to start your journey into wood turning? Not sure where to start when it comes to wood turning lathe? Hey, I'm Anthony, part of the Bold Wood Turners team. If you're new here, make sure you hit that subscribe button for more wood turning content just like this. Any links that are mentioned in today's video will be in the description box just below the video. In today's video, I'm going to take you through all the basic parts of a wood turning lathe and a few creature comforts that make your time at the lathe just a little bit more enjoyable. So, let's get started. I know when I started my foray into wood turning, I didn't have much of a clue about what did what on our wood turning lathe. I was lucky enough to have my dad to show me the ropes and the basics of a wood turning lathe. So, first things first. A wood turning lathe basically consists of a few things. A headstock, tailstock, tool rest and banjo, lathe bed or lathe stand, and of course, some means of propulsion whether that be a pole lathe like this one or an electronic motor. Now generally these parts play the same role on any lathe. Some will be bigger, some will be more bulky, some will be heavier, some will be smaller, very much dependent on the type of lathe that you are looking at, as well as brand and price. Now let's delve a little bit deeper starting with the headstock. The headstock on most lathes is generally made of cast iron. Cast iron is ideal because of its weight vibration dampening properties and it is also known for holding its shape in fluctuating temperatures. So the headstock houses some very important parts to the lathe. First we've got the spindle, then the spindle pulleys, the motor pulleys, the pulley belt and of course the motor itself. First of all, let's talk about the spindle. The spindle is the heart of the headstock. In wood turning, the spindle is the part that holds and spins our work pieces. Now the spindle has several different parts to it. First is the thread. There are many different sizes of spindle threads. Bench top, mini or midi laves more commonly have a one by eight TPI spindle thread or a three quarter by 16 TPI. Your larger lathe and some midi lathes have an M33 by 3.5 spindle thread or a one and a half by six TPI. The reason for the larger spindles on the bigger lathes is because they can deal with bigger and heavier work pieces. So the next important part of your spindle is the Morse taper. So basically your Morse taper is what holds your drive center in your spindle. So to keep this simple, think of your spindle as a female. The spindle has a hollow housing that is tapered on the inside. The arbor on your drive center is the male, which has the corresponding Morse taper to fit inside of your spindle. This is held in by friction, basically. The most common size of Morse taper is a two Morse taper. Now your older and your much smaller lathes have a one Morse taper, and your large lathes, like the VB36 Master Bowl Turner, has a three Morse taper. Now, if you take a look at the picture I've just popped up on the screen, you can see why that monster has such a big taper. The other part of your spindle is the hand wheel. Now, some lathes come with a handle on the spindle. Some, like my other lathe, the Record Power CL3, didn't, unfortunately, and I had to purchase one. A handle, although a simple addition, makes using your lathe just that little bit easier, especially when applying finishes when you want to keep your hand away from that workpiece. Now there is another bit to your spindle called an indexing system. Most lathes nowadays have them. We'll talk a little bit more about them later. So next we have the pulley wheels. The number of pulley wheels that you have inside your headstock will depend on the lathe that you are looking at. Most electronic variable speed lathes will have two or three pulley wheels. Lathes like my CL3 had five. On the CL3, the five pulley wheels determine the five different speeds that you have. And you have to change them manually by moving the belt over from one to the other. Generally, if you're looking to buy a brand new lathe, you'll receive an instruction booklet telling you what each pulley speed is. 
The pulleys do more than just change the speed of your lathe. The largest pulley wheel will achieve the higher speeds. This is perfect for small faceplate work and most of your spindle work. Higher speeds don't work well for large diameter pieces. This is because of something called the peripheral speed. The outside of your piece is what's spinning at the highest speed. On a small piece, that peripheral speed on the outside isn't far off the speed that the lathe is telling you. Now, on your bigger pieces, once you're getting over four or five inch, that speed increases dramatically. That's when you use the smaller pulley. Although you get less speed with the smaller pulley, you get a higher torque. So if you think of it as your gears in your car. Now, if you're traveling down a motorway, it's nice and flat, you should be doing 70 miles an hour in a high gear, and the engine is not gonna struggle with that at all. You try and going up a hill in sick gear, that engine is really going to struggle. So that's when you need to drop it down to second. That lower gear provides you more torque to be able to go up a steep hill. It's the same thing when it comes to a bigger, heavier piece on your lathe. You need the lower speeds with the higher torque to be able to get that piece moving. Now that is obviously very important once you start presenting the tool to the piece. If you're trying to turn a big piece on the higher speeds with the bigger pulley wheel, the torque won't be there to push through the cut, unfortunately, and that's when your motor will stall out. That's what you need to use the smaller pulley wheel for. It gives you that extra torque to get through the cut. So the next part to look at is the motor itself. Basically, you want to turn big stuff, get a bigger motor. You want to turn small stuff, get a smaller motor. But one thing to keep in mind, if you do get a motor that hasn't got very much power, i.e. something that is only three quarters of a horsepower, and then you decide you do want to start turning some larger pieces, this is where you'll run into problems with the motor stalling out on you. Generally though, if you're only looking to turn pens, key rings, bottle stoppers, things such like that, half horsepower to three quarter horsepower is gonna be absolutely fine for you, but you can only really use it for that stuff. If you're wanting to do bigger pieces on a regular basis, you need something with at least one horsepower. What you have to consider is, yes, you can turn something big on that smaller motor, but you will be working that motor closer to its capacity than if you had a stronger motor. Again, Taking the car for example, if you have a car that has 100 horsepower and a car that has 300 horsepower, they're both traveling at 100 miles an hour. Now, both cars are perfectly capable of doing that, but the car with 300 horsepower is nowhere near its higher speed, which means it's nowhere near its total capacity. Now, if you take the 100 horsepower car for example, that is now traveling very close to its highest top speed meaning you are now putting a lot of pressure on that engine to reach its maximum capacity and if you do that a lot that engine will break down it's the same thing with the motor on a lathe if you put big pieces on a small motor it might keep working for a while the highly likely thing to happen is that you will burn that motor out and then you'll end up having to replace the lathe anyway. So you might as well go for something that's already got a higher capacity just in case you want to start venturing into something else. Just remember, you can still turn little things on a big lathe. Next, let's talk about the tailstock. Now the tailstock's main job is to give your workpiece extra support while you're turning it. It is also there to use accessories like a Jacob's chuck. We'll talk a little bit more about accessories later on. The tailstock can be broken down into roughly four or five different parts. First, we've got the main body. Then we've got the quill, which houses the Morse taper. Then we've got the lock for the quill. And finally, we've got the hand wheel. The main body of the tailstock, just like the headstock, commonly made from cast iron. The quill is what holds your live sensors utilizing a motor taper just like the headstock. Now the lock for the quill does exactly what it says in the tin. It locks the quill. This is to stop the quill from simply spinning around as soon as the workpiece starts to spin. 
Basically, down the side of your quill, there'll be a machine channel for a screw to sit in. This is then set into a spring-loaded handle, which allows you to move the handle out of the way of any pieces, like when you're doing something that is a live edge. Now, the hand wheel on the tailstock is basically there to move the quill in and out as far as your quill would allow you. Now, the quill on my machine, the Coronet Envoy, will extend to 90 millimeters. Bigger lathes generally extend further, smaller lathes ex extend less. So next we have the lathe bed or lathe stand. Now my lathe has a cast iron bed as most larger lathes generally do. I have seen some cheap lathes made out of pressed steel, even plastic, the little ones, you know what I mean. This, although cheap, it doesn't really offer much stability while you're actually using the lathe. One other option I've seen are heavy duty steel bars. My other lathe, the CL3, utilize these. Now, in my opinion, cast iron is absolutely the best option. But if you're looking at other lathes that don't come with cast iron, my next choice would definitely be the heavy duty steel bars as they work fantastic on the CL3 lathe. Then we have lathe stand or legs. Again, cast iron is generally what I would go for, and most of the bigger lathes come with cast iron legs. Some lathes don't have the option of cast iron legs. Like the CL3, this came with a steel stand, which did a fairly decent job for the most part. You'll see these type of stands generally sold with smaller and cheaper lathes, and then you've got your bench mountable lathes. Personally, if you're looking for that kind of thing, I would suggest mounting it to something as heavy duty as you possibly can to reduce any vibration or movement during the use of the lathe. Then we have the banjo and tool rest. As with everything else on the lathe, it's made of cast iron on mine. Most of them you'll see, they'll be made of cast iron. Obviously, the bigger the lathe, the bigger the banjo, and generally the bigger the tool rest that will come with your lathe. When it comes to the tool rest, there are at least two important factors to take into consideration. First is the diameter of the stem. This corresponds to the diameter of the banjo. This is the part of the tool rest that sits into your banjo. The most common with medium to bigger lathes is a one inch or 25.4 millimeter. The tool rest is locked into place by a set, again, set into a sprung handle to help keep it out of the way of work things. Now they do come in bigger or smaller sizes depending on the lathe that you're looking at. Another important factor to take into account when it comes to your tool rest is the length of it. If you're doing small items, for the most part, you'll get away with a four inch or six inch tool rest. Generally, smaller lathes come with that size of tool rest. If you're doing long spindle work, you can go up to 15 and even bigger. One other thing to note with the tool rest is the length of the stem. With the smaller lathes, the length of the stem is smaller. This is to allow for the smaller capacity of the lathe. Now this is important if you come to replace or add another tool rest to your arsenal. If you don't know the length of your tool rest, then you could end up buying a tool rest that has too long of a stem, which will either sit out of the bottom of the banjo and hit the lathe bed as you're trying to move it into position, or it will be too high for when you are cutting. The banjo slides across the lathe bed to wherever you need it to be. This is then locked using something called a cam lock. Now you'll find these on both the headstock and the tailstock as well. This allows the headstock and tailstock to move up and down the bed to wherever you need them to be and then to be locked in secure. So the next thing we're going to talk about is your lathe capacity. When it comes to lathe capacity, there are two numbers to be on the lookout. Number one is your swing. This is the largest diameter faceplate work that you can do, i.e. bowl or platter. Now, if you're only wanting to turn stuff like pens and key rings, smaller things like that, that aren't very big in diameter, this number isn't going to be as important to you as the other. If you are wanting to turn bowls and platters and big hollow forms and stuff like that, generally, for me, a good starting point is 12 inches over your bed. My CL3, which was my first lathe, has 12 inches over the bed, and I got by with that very well for a year. For me, a good starting capacity would be a 12 inch swing. This will allow you to do some fairly large bowls and until you get a piece on the lathe, you don't realize how big 12 inch really is. Now I know to us blokes, we always want a couple more inches, but when it comes down to it, if you put a 12 inch bowl blank on your lathe, 
when you really look at it, it's actually a fairly large piece. Now, if you do want to step up, my lathe here is 16 inch, you go up to absolutely mega numbers. If you are wanting to do big pieces and can't afford to get a lathe with a bigger capacity over the bed, you can, with some lathes, get an outboard turning tool rest. This will allow you to do some extremely large pieces, but on each lathe, this is a limited number, so please check when you are buying this. The other important number to keep an eye out for is the capacity between centers. This number is aimed at the spindle turner. So as with the motor, be sure to get one that's gonna suit you long term. Because the worst thing that you can do is buy a lathe and then a year later, like myself, buy another one. <laughs> Alternatively, on some lathes, you can actually extend the bed, but this is done by purchasing an accessory lathe bed extension. Now, let's take a look at some of the accessories that you will usually receive with your lathe. Firstly, and quite importantly, you receive a drive center. These have a Morse taper, which allows them to sit into your headstock. As the name suggests, this is what drives the wood around. Drive centers are generally used for spindle work. There isn't enough support for bowl turning. The kind of drive center you'll most likely receive will be a four pronged drive. And quite simply, the drive has four prongs on it and a center point. This is usually hit into the spindle and then slid into the headstock using the live center in your tailstock to support the other end. Speaking of live centers, these work similar to your drive center being that they have a Morse taper, although the live center only goes into your tailstock. The reason it's called a live center is because it spins freely on a bearing inside the head. This is only there to help support your workpiece. It is not to be used in the headstock. With it being a live head, all it will do is spin the Morse taper and the head will stay dead still. You'll also receive a knockout bar to remove your drive center from the headstock. And if the lathe doesn't come with a self-ejecting tailstock, you will also use it to remove your live center. You will also receive a faceplate. Now the size of these will depend on the brand of lathe that you purchase. I know Axminster provide a four inch faceplate with a brand new lathe. The record power I have here gave me a three inch faceplate. Your faceplate is basically a machine piece of metal that you screw onto faceplate work. Your faceplate will have a thread matching that of your spindle. Now for the most part, that is what your basic lathe will consist of. Now let's talk about some of the extras that you can have on your lathe to make life just a little bit more enjoyable. First of all, let's talk about the variable speed lathes. Now I touched on this a little bit earlier, so let's go a little bit more in depth about it. So as I mentioned, the CO3 lathe that I have is restricted to just five speeds. These speeds are determined by the five different sizes of pulley wheels. Now my new lathe, the Record Power Coronet Envoy, comes with a variable speed motor. The actual speed on these machines is changed il electronically using a dial. Sometimes these are mounted to your headstock. On this lathe, as you can see, it's mounted within a magnetic control box, which has a long lead on it, meaning I can move it to wherever I want on the lathe. For me, this is the preferred option, so you don't have to reach over or around any spinning work to be able to turn the lathe on or off. As with this one, you can find a digital spindle speed readout. If fitted, you'll also find a forward and reverse switch, as well as an emergency stop button. On some lathes, the emergency stop button is on a long lead just itself, like your jet or palmatic lathes. So they are magnetized just like the control box, but, it is, but you can turn the lathe on and off just using the emergency stop button. The next thing that I consider to be a bit of a perk when it comes to buying a lathe is your spindle lock. Not all lathes come with a spindle lock, unfortunately. Again, for example, my CL3 didn't come with a spindle lock. So to fasten on your faceplate or to remove it, more importantly, use the two spanners provided. Basically, your spindle lock sits into predetermined holes on one of your pulley wheels. This allows you to easily remove or put on things like your faceplate or chucks. Now your spindle lock 
generally is tied in with something called an indexing system. It's not on all lathes, so I feel like it's perk. Now, on this lathe, the indexing system is several holes machined into one of my pulleys, which the spindle lock then sits into. These often have 24 points, although other lathes do have more or less indexing points. Now, the indexing system can be used to simply create something like a clock, where you need to have the numbers at a specific point on the workpiece. You can also use them to create a bunch of different patterns. Now, if you've seen some of my dad's work, senior of the Baldwood Turner, he quite commonly uses an indexing system to create the pattern before texturing his work. If you want to take a look at some of the work that he does, or even get some tuition on how he does it, head to www.thebaldwoodturners.co.uk and take a look at some of his upcoming IRDs, which are interactive remote demos. Now, some of you have seen my dad's work. While you're there, make sure you subscribe to the website to be notified of any upcoming IRDs and to be entered into any future competitions. Just follow the link in the description box below. One last thing that can make your life a little bit easier when it comes to the lathe is a swiveling headstock. A swiveling headstock means you can turn the headstock 90 or 180 degrees to allow for outboard turning. If you're wanting to do outboard turning, most slaves, you will have to purchase an accessory kit. This feature is also helpful when you have limited workshop space like myself. Now, as you can see, my workshop is wall to wall, four foot. So I really don't have that much space. But with the use of the swiveling headstock, I quite often turn it just a little bit when I'm hollowing out the inside of a bowl or when I'm doing hollow forms. This allows space for longer tools and for different cuts, for example, an undercut where the handle of your tool needs to be on the opposite side of the lathe. It also means you don't have to lean over the lathe when trying to get the best cuts on your bowl or hollow forms, which reduces back pain overall, which for longevity in this kind of hobby, you really need to be thinking about. So that's it. I hope this video has helped to clear up any confusion about wood turning lathes and all the different parts. Now, if you have any questions at all, just pop them in the comments box below and me or my dad will get back to you. Thank you all for watching and if you like the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Thanks very much and I'll see you next time.